Okay, so the topic we are going to look at today is called the contributions of anthropology to the understanding of regionalism, communalism, and ethnic and political movements. A very vast topic, as you can see. So anthropology, as we know, is the detailed study of a group or a culture, which helps us to understand that culture better. It involves very often living with the group for at least rather a year, sometimes longer, uh, living like the group that is taking on in many ways the ways of life of that group, and therefore in some sense entering their world view, entering the way in which that particular group sees the world. So the anthropology of regionalism or communalism or ethnic and political movements aim to help us to understand these movements better. And what, given that this is a very vast topic and you have a very short answer to write based on it, what I think the best way to go about it is to look at one example of each of these ideas, regionalism, communalism, ethnic violence, political violence, so political movements, and see what an anthropologist has done or what a particular ethnography, ethnography is what anthropologists do, these are social anthropologists, this is what they do, and what they have done to help us understand these concepts better. So the first book that I want to talk about or the first study that I want to talk about under the rubric regionalism is Nandini Sundar's book Subalterns and Sovereigns, an Anthropological History of Bastar, 1854 to 2006. Now, as you can imagine from the title itself, this is more of a historical and contemporary anthropological study. There is something called historical anthropology, which actually involves looking at government documents, looking at whatever you can find from whatever voices you can find from the past. But Nandini Sundar not only looks at the past, but also at the present. In fact, the second edition of the book comes right up to the present in understanding what is happening with the Naxalites in Chhattisgarh, in the Bastar region, and so on. But what does Nandini Sundar do in this book? She actually looks at various things. She looks at the customary law of the tribals and the Adivasis in Bastar. She looks at how colonial anthropology led to the formation of laws in the region. And she looks at the history of those laws and what they have meant for actual people moving from the pre-independence to the post-independence period right up to the present where in fact there's something like a civil war in that region. So that's subalterns and sovereigns and it's a good example of looking at a region which is the region of uh, Bastar, part of the new state in many ways of Chhattisgarh and looking at how the Adivasis understand the idea of region. The second book is to look at communalism and does look at communalism and it's by Megha Kumar. It's a recent ethnography. It's called Communalism and Sexual Violence, Ahmedabad since 1969. And it's an extremely interesting study that looks at centrally the Gujarat riots of 2002, but also looks at it partly historically, partly in the present. She studies government reports, she studies Hindu nationalist publications, she studies civil society uh, consultations, she looks, she does detailed interviews with both activists and actual riot victims. So in many ways it's a great example of how does an anthropologist look at the idea of communalism? In fact, she gives a different shape to how we understand communalism because it enters in many ways the domain, as I said, as anthropologists do from within. Ethnic movements, for the ethnic movements, there's a wonderful book. Actually, when, when we think ethnicity in India, we always think only the Northeast or we think of some separatist idea. Whereas in fact, ethnic movements, uh, this particular book that I'm going to talk about actually breaks with these traditional ideas of ethnicity that we have. It's a wonderful ethnography by Sarah Schneiderman and it's called Rituals of Ethnicity, the Thangmi Identities between Nepal and India. And actually she's not looking only at Nepal and India, but also Tibet. So it's a kind of a tripartite ethnography. It's beautifully done. So she looks at the Nepali context, which is largely dominated by the Maoists. She looks at the Gorkhalan movement in India, and she also looks at the Tibetan movement in autonomous China, and tries to understand how the Thangmi people, who are in many ways caught 
between these three regions, understand their own identity and understand ethnicity. And they understand ethnicity through ritual, actually. So it's a very, very interesting study showing that this breaks with traditional understandings of nationhood, of boundaries that we are used to, but in fact show that communities live across boundaries. And you can see this even in the Northeast, where lots of ex excellent ethnographies in the Northeast by people like William Van Schendel and so on have shown us that the Northeast does not particularly, the states there do not particularly see themselves in relation only to the Indian nation, which is how we understand ethnicity and the nation and how we always trap the Northeast in terms of our understanding. And the final um, ethnography or book that we, I want to talk, it's not yet a book, in fact, she hasn't yet published it as a book, it's still a series of articles, hopefully the book will be out soon, is on the question of political movements, and it is Bela Bhatia's extraordinary work in Bihar. Her PhD was entitled Naxalism in Central Bihar, some articles are published, and the central one I'm going to talk about is the one in Economic and Political Weekly in 2005, called the Naxalite Movement in Central Bihar. Now, Bela Bhatia's work is extraordinary because actually the Naxalite movement in Bihar is extremely factionalized and the factions are quite violently against each other. But somehow Bela managed to talk to all the factions to try and find out and map in some sense a history of the factions. But she also found out far more interesting things that, for example, we think of the Naxalites when we think of Naxalites in the contemporary moment, we think of them as somehow, as the state put it, the largest internal security threat. We see them as violent and as therefore dangerous or talking outside the logic of the state and so on. But actually, if you look at and Bela has studied the Naxalite demands and the Naxalite constitutions, and in many ways, what they are demanding is very much within the rubric and the logic of the state. They're demanding their rights. But she also tries to understand what it means to actually have a political movement that is talking about the voices of the poor. And she also questions the way in which the Naxalite parties move in relation to the voices of the poor and feels like that, in fact, they should be run by the poor and what the poor want and what the people of Bihar want rather than, rather than what the party or the various parties want. So these studies in each of these uh, ideas from regionalism to communalism and ethnic and political movements, four areas, show us that what anthropology teaches us and what anthropology is great at is giving us an insider view of movements that we know very little about, that we understand very little about. It also helps us imaginatively enter another world, another world and understand that world as our own. Almost this is the great risky work that anthropologists do. And so what the contribution of anthropology is to understanding all of these areas is that it helps us understand them better, it helps us understand them intimately, and it helps us think about them in non-conventional ways and not in the traditional ways that we are used to thinking about them as we are trained to by the Indian state.